Hello, I'm veterinarian Dr. Karen Fling, and welcome back to Pet Talk Podcast. And I'm here today with my co-host. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Will McCauley. Welcome back for our third episode. Um, been going really well so far. We hope y'all have enjoyed all the information we've been able to bring to you. And we have a, uh, a special treat for you today. Yes, we do. We have our first guest ever. And this is Ginger Walton. And Ginger, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, you're with Invisible Fence. Is yes, that right? Thank you very much. Great. And uh, we're going to be talking to Ginger a little bit more as we go along here in the first segment of our podcast. But I'd like to kind of touch base back to what we were talking about last week a little bit about traveling with pets. And Dr. McCauley, you have found kind of a neat site or a place where this topic was covered a little further. That's right. We did talk about um, the puppytravel.com as well as the pettravel.com. But actually, the, the uh, Today Show has their own little segment they put out on their website um, that talks about uh, airborne pets, six ways to make sure your furry friends fly safely. A little tough to say, but um, they have great tips in here. It actually echoes a lot of the stuff we said. Um, book early, know the airline's pet policies, um, You know, be proactive about everything, just make sure that everything's lined up. Um, and so if they want actual written stuff on there, uh, you know, that's definitely They've got a great go. site there. Absolutely. Right. And you mentioned being proactive, and, and I agree with you on that. And I just want to remind everybody, if their pets are not microchipped, please go ahead and take that step. Uh, call your veterinarian about making making that appointment today. Statistics show that 90% of pets without proper identification won't make it get make it back home if they get lost. And it's so easy. And we talked last week about how easy it is to say it won't happen to me. And unfortunately, I'm one of those statistics of the one in three pets will get lost during their lifetime. And as we're talking about traveling with pets, I think that's a perfect introduction for, for Ginger Walton here uh, with Invisible Fence. Um, she's here to help us not let our pets travel out of our homes and our yards when we're not planning right. for that. So I know Invisible Fence has been around for a really long time, and uh, I've been acquainted with the product uh, over the years. Mm -hmm. But here recently, I think there's some really new, exciting things that your company is offering. And so uh, tell us a little more about that. I know I visited with you at a pet fair recently, mm -hmm. and uh, we talked about a sneaky cat I have. And I think when people think about Invisible Fence, they're, they're thinking about dog protection a lot of times. But yeah. yeah, not necessarily. So, so what are some of the new things happening with Invisible Fence? Well, with Invisible Fence now, we have the new technology called Boundary Plus. Um, it allows 30% more of the yard, so um, the dogs get the full use. It's a zero lot line of technology for people with very small uh, property, um, house to house, you know. Um, we also have the... Um, <clears throat> The Shield Plus, which is what you were talking about as far as the sneaky cat. And <laughs> right. so you put I have that, one of those, my yeah. kitty cat, John. Uh -huh. You put that by the front door. Um, they wear a collar, and it just transmits a signal to where they stay away from the That's areas. Fantastic. And, and do they have to have like a big, clunky like, no, actually we receiver have the, on their collar? No, we actually have um, the smallest receiver in the market. Um, it's very, very small. Oh, that's yeah, great. So something even a, a cat or a tiny dog could wear? Yes, we put it on um, animals from eight weeks and up. Oh, wow. Cats and dogs. Wow, eight weeks and up. Yes. So a no. little tiny yes. little puppy Absolutely. or kitten could wear this. Yes, so yes. The, the, um, the transmitter actually weighs, I think, half an ounce. Wow. Way wow. better to I, start early, though. Yes. Get them used to having their boundaries set when they're puppies and kittens. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. To, a good know. part of training. Absolutely. Yes. And that's one of the things I love about Invisible mm -hmm. Fence. You offer not only the... the products and the tools to help the pets but you work with the pet owner to actually train them and right. work with them and their pet to right. really be set up for success is that yes, right we do we offer training we do full training or partial training with the installations just depending on what the customer needs right and and that's another thing that i've appreciated about invisible fence the more i've learned about the company it really does seem to be tailored to what the the pet owner needs and and what they're looking for with their pet so i, I just cannot wait to work with you uh with john the alley cat he was a rescue cat in fact from east lake pet orphanage and uh, he is sneaky and he will hide out behind a chair mm -hmm. in the living room and he will stalk down low and he'll watch <laughs> the behavior he knows when shoes go on when a coat goes on when there's activity happening in that front hallway that somebody's getting ready to open that door right. and he will shoot out like a bullet mm -hmm. and uh, i probably shouldn't say this on air but we we <laughs> say we we have a neighbor that's a little bit like mr mcgregor right. so mm -hmm. the kids are all always worried that John is going to go to Mr. McGregor's house. So it's really a fear thing for our family. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to be one of your, your customers.
customers. I want to try this product out and see, help you. see if we can actually stop John from doing this. And and Roderick, our, our cameraman there, uh, he's he's so great at capturing so many things on video. I just I want him to videotape this and I want to see how well it works. So, <laughs> works very well. Uh, you'll have a customer for life if we can stop this naughty cat. I actually had a horse on it for seven and a half years. Wow. They don't do it. Um, per se, but I personally had a horse on it, a racehorse on it for seven and a half years. No that kidding. never left a non-fenced property. Wow, Very that's nice. unbelievable. Yes. So uh, puppies and kittens from eight weeks old on up to horses? Yes. Um, well, we don't do it for horses. I did <laughs> because I knew it would work. Well, well and that's one work. of those yeah, customized for, products. Right. They do do it for donkeys. We have it on burros, um, goats. Wow. Yes, it's very, yeah. very wide range, actually. If you can get it around its neck, more than likely we can keep them right, contained. Right, right. So it's a little tiny few ounce. You said half mm-hmm. ounce? How, how much is it? It's a half an ounce. Half ounce little sensor yes. that helps to keep yes. them in their territory. Mm-hmm. And Tell me about how, more about how the uh, new technology works, the new No Boundaries system. Well, the, well you is said No called? Boundaries, called sorry. Boundary Plus Sorry, technology. Boundary Plus, yes. yes. <laughs> there are boundaries. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's John, <laughs> John that has no boundaries. Right. That was the confusing part. Yeah. 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 How it works um, is the old technology would throw a signal field between one foot to up to 10 foot, which would take in a small yard, a lot of the um, available yard. Um, The new technology now is a zero lot line, meaning we can bury the line at the very edge of the property line and it allows them all the way to the very edge. Oh, okay. So there is no, right. Right, exactly. There's There's not that range where it might be setting off, even though they're 10 feet from the edge of their Correct, right. It allows them to the very edge. So So then that way the pet can have maximum area in their yard and not be restricted. So yeah, Yeah. more space is better. Amen. That's what John says, John the cat. What's good about having a a big backyard if you can't uh, use oh, it all for yeah. sure mm-hmm. yes that's it right. takes that 30 percent more yard with the old technology wow. so that's a lot mm-hmm. yeah you know um, wow. and it can be more than that just mm-hmm. depending on how big the signal field is and that also depends on how big the dog is if it's a bigger dog it has to have a larger signal field mm-hmm. so it can take up to 50 percent more mm-hmm. but the so new technology more space avoids for your that. pet yes. that's great now and is then, invisible fence the only company that has this technology yes sir invisible fence is the only company that has the boundary plus technology we talked last week that uh, Invisible Fence, you know, they were an early player kind of into this field, and they seem to have dominated the market in a lot of ways. Definitely seem to be pushing the boundaries, uh, or excuse me, the ba- uh, <laughs> I keep going back to expanding that. The, expanding the boundaries. The boundaries. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. um, well, good. But, but keeping boundaries Absolutely. at the same time. Mm-hmm. The biggest That's the boundaries point, you can. keep the boundaries. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> right. Well, and, and you talk about them having kind of the corner on the market with this sort of technology. One of the things that I love about your company, about mm-hmm. Invisible Fence, is is you're protecting pets and working with individuals for the best solutions for their pets. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, like with John, he doesn't need yard protection. Correct. He really needs that barrier at the doorway. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's really great that there are custom-made programs. And I also like your community support. And, in fact, uh, the neat thing for me, and I mentioned this earlier, was that uh, Ginger and I actually met at a, a pet fair, a Fun in the mm-hmm. Sun with Fido event, and then uh, another pet fair after that. Mm-hmm. And uh, these people are out in the trenches, uh, not only protecting pets within their own home environment, but also helping pets at large in the community. And uh, tell us a little bit about your your program with the fire departments that help pets. I think that's really amazing. That program's called Project Breathe, and we donate um, fire ma- um, oxygen masks to the firefighters. Um, and we have donated the last time 150 masks to the city of Dallas. Great. Um, and... Anybody That's else pretty need exciting. Anything, you know, let us know. Yes, uh, pretty exciting. And, and in yes. fact, ironically, at the first event we met at, uh, there was a particular group that was working with various neighborhoods right. around uh, the Dallas area mm-hmm. trying to raise funds to have these right. masks provided for fire departments mm-hmm. to help pets. And then, lo and behold, there's Ginger and her team, and they, they came in and said, hey, we can really help you with that. And, and you're doing this not only in the Dallas community, but other communities. Is Across that right? the United States, yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah. very impressive. No, uh, the oxygen mask we're talking about, of course, you've seen the ones they put on humans, but you can imagine, you know, a full size adult oxygen mask that a firefighter mm-hmm. or a you know first responder may use right. at a fire where someone needs oxygen is not going to fit over the face of a cat or a kitten or a small dog. And right. so there are specially designed ones um, that Invisible Fence has donated to um, our fire departments as well as other communities mm-hmm. that actually fits better onto the small. Yeah, it's small more like muzzle. a cone small that can yeah. go yeah. over that whole muzzle like and a, yeah. really provide that oxygen. Which makes yes. all the difference, that delivery system 
system, you know, in a cat or a dog that has been trapped mm-hmm. in a fire that is suffering from some degree of smoke right. inhalation, best treatment is to get oxygen to them as quickly yes. and efficiently as possible. And so invisible fence is playing a big part in that. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, we certainly appreciate your, your work in the community, this great project uh, that you have going here and also the new products you have. And, and I will uh, look forward to talking to you soon about John the alley cat at my house. And hopefully we can get Roderick to cover some footage about how oh, that works. Yeah, that'll be a lot of fun. Good stories. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we're going to take a break now. I know Ginger has lots of other family to help and so we're going to let her get back on the road thank you so much for joining us today and uh, we'll look forward to talking to you more in the future i look forward to it great thanks so much thank you be back in a sec today our pet of the week is athena athena is an east lake pet orphanage orphan waiting for a new home and she's a rather unique breed Uh, she is a mixture of a west highland white terrier and uh, something else we don't know what the something else is but as far as west highland white terriers go or westies they are a scottish breed of dog and they are known for their spunk their intelligence and their loyalty to their family so she'll make somebody a great home Uh, She's a beautiful dog. Uh, She has that lovely pure white fur, uh, as the Westies typically do, and they make a wonderful, wonderful family dog. So give Athena a try. Welcome back to the Pet Talk Podcast. I'm Dr. Karen Fling, and when we wrapped up at the break just a moment ago, we were talking a little bit about uh, keeping your pets from traveling outside of your your home or your yard, but traveling makes me think about the holidays, Dr. McCauley. So what's on your mind relative to the holidays? Absolutely. You know, we kind of uh, teased about this a little bit last week. Uh, I'm talking about uh, holiday foods um, that your pet may uh, be exposed to somehow, whether you knowingly uh, offer them a little bit of that turkey or a little bit of green beans or if they happen to like my dogs find a way to get into the trash or right and there's there's just more tempting things around absolutely I, I think people a lot of times really want to treat their pets you know they think gosh you know I'm having all this great food and these wonderful things I want to share it I love my pet and uh, may not be such a good idea exactly we we definitely um, applaud the uh, desire to involve your pets in you know the holidays give them a little a uh, little something special but you need to remember that there are risk posed with feeding your pets um, human foods a, a lot of uh, pets just think oh uh, since you know macaroni and cheese is you know good for my soul uh, my pet will be fine with it a lot of but pets think that a lot of pets think that for <laughs> too yeah exactly they'll, people and pets they'll side with that. you yeah but i do want to kind of point out that there are um, certain guidelines to follow there are serious health risk associated with feeding your pet um, different foods um, such risk we see a lot of times around the holidays is choking on bones um, yes. so people think oh it's a dog it can eat a bone um, but in reality bones have a very very high uh, probability in some cases of getting caught or stuck or causing right. some kind of GI damage as right I, I can't count the number of cases over time that I've had with little round marrow bones mm-hmm. that somebody might have in a nice big stew pot with their their soup they're cooking in the cold weather Mm -hmm. and the marrow bones are notorious for getting hooked on that lower jaw Mm -hmm. and then of course the dog panics and paws at their mouth when they can't get the bone off and then their tissue swells and then before we know it they're having to come in for anesthesia and uh, a saw treatment to get the bone off and Mm -hmm. And broken teeth. Yeah, I've seen uh, actual bones get stuck between the teeth on the roof of the mouth. They'd get turned sideways and stuck up in there. Dogs are pawing at their face. Some dogs have gone on for weeks like that. Right. And the owner can't decide what's going on. They can't figure out. I, I've why. had people say that, gosh, there's this horrible smell coming from mm-hmm. my dog, and I don't know where it's coming from, and it's this rotten, decaying bone up in the roof of the mouth. Exactly. So, so it's best to uh, to avoid feeding bones of any kind to your dog. Um, they just, they're just they just too risky to do that. And, and even if they've had bones before and done fine, so often we see people that say, gosh, you know, my dog always has a bone, loves it, and you just never know when that time's going to happen where there's going to be a crisis. And, mm-hmm. and probably the one of the worst cases I've ever seen with a bone is where a dog had a piece of bone that they tried to swallow and it wound up getting stuck in the esophagus in the chest cavity. Oh, so yeah. we wound up having to go in and get this thing out of the chest cavity, which was major surgery. And then, of course, with something like that lodged in the, the esophagus and the, you know, the tube between the, the mouth and the stomach, basically, uh, strictures are a worry. And even if you can get it out, just ongoing scarring from 
that injury. So exactly. bad news. Not Best to stay it. away. Not, not worth it. Exactly. It. Agreed. You know, even if it's not bones, if you're feeding the dog, uh, letting them lick the bottom of the pans and stuff from the casserole dishes, um, you risk things like just major GI upsets. So dogs can have vomiting and diarrhea, a lot of um, enteritis, uh, which is a swelling of the lining of the small intestine. Um, we see that a lot of times during the holidays. And then the big one that I know vets think about, um, you know, not maybe not so much. say the P owners, word. The P word, pancreatitis. Um, right. So uh, people may have heard this, um, humans getting the disease, which is an inflammation of an organ in the abdomen called the pancreas. The pancreas, uh, you may know, produces a lot of things, insulin being the big one, as well as um, a lot of GI enzymes to help um, yeah. Yeah, digestive food. enzymes. Absolutely. Yep. So right. um, an inflammation of the pancreas in dogs um, is often brought on by eating a big fatty meal or just, you know, getting into trash, something like that, or Spicy being fed holiday food. Or, food. You know, Spicy some dogs foods. are so sensitive that if it's anything off of their regular diet, that could be enough to trip a Absolutely. pancreatitis Absolutely. episode. And it's not just a swelling or anything. It's an inflammation that dogs oftentimes, they need to be hospitalized for, for several right. days in the hospital on IV fluids, right. antibiotics, it's a big and pain deal. meds. It's a big deal. Um, it's a big deal. I've actually talked to a couple of different people that in treating their dog for the same condition, they've confessed that either they have or another loved one has had pancreatitis. And, and talking to people that have had the condition, they say that it is so unbelievably painful uh, that you just really uh, almost wish you were dead at the mm-hmm. point that you have it, that it's so miserable. Absolutely. It's way better just avoid that risk um, as well as the GI upset, the vomiting, the diarrhea by just avoiding giving, you know, those fit, rich, fatty, spicy foods that we're so tempted to give our pups um, right. and our kittens. And, but... and think about the trash, like you said, because mm-hmm. uh, if you have one of those dogs that's a trash can surfer or a counter surfer, sometimes even though we don't intentionally give these things, mm-hmm. The, the pets will seek these out and, and find them. And I had that happen with turkey skin one year, and I will never forget it. And my poor dog was just moaning uh, with pain and discomfort. And fortunately, she was one of the lucky ones where when we did that intensive fluid therapy and IV antibiotics and supportive care, uh, she rode through the, the crisis pretty uneventfully. But some of these dogs can actually die from this. Absolutely. Yeah, I, uh, at, during my internship, we saw quite a few pancreatitis cases, and I think um, – one of the worst ones that the dog had to be hospitalized for a solid week ended up costing about six thousand wow. dollars um so it's intense it, and very intense very intensive and and even if they don't get sick you are um, instilling bad habits into your dog by feeding them from the table or feeding them human food a lot of people hate it when the, the dog or you know cat scratches at your leg tries to beg for food well what would you do if you had if you were the dog and that's what gets you a response if you every time right. you paw yeah. on mom's leg she slips you a little piece of turkey or something and or I, mashed I've potatoes. got to admit, admit I'm a little bit of a softy and a little permissive <laughs> about the treats at my house but not not human food right so I use bland easy to digest treats and, and things as a veterinarian that I believe are safe mm-hmm. and of course uh, if in doubt ask your pet's veterinarian about what the safest treats are to use if you are going to provide treats and and certainly the training is an important thing and you can still give treats but make it a part of uh, going outside when they're supposed to make it a part of good behavior or uh, you know I think dogs and cats like a, an earn and learn sort of philosophy where they they work for their treats and they learn tricks or commands and it really I think intensifies that bond and makes the treat process so much better it's that sense of accomplishment on their that's part that's right they get rewarded for it that's right and, and and stay away from chicken jerky right yes yes, yes. definitely all those jerky treats uh, you know we mentioned that on, i think on our first podcast right. stay away from those right. um, other foods stay away from there are specific toxic foods that at no time should you ever feed your dog um, most people know that chocolate is toxic to dogs um, in certain amounts the offending chemical in chocolate um, is called theobromine um, which is mm-hmm. a kind of a uh, a methyl relative. xanthine. Methyl xanthine. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> Easy for me to Just say. Just <laughs> like uh, caffeine, actually. So it's right. kind of a cousin to caffeine. So caffeine is also very toxic um, to dogs um, and cats. Um, things you might not know, uh, grapes and raisins are also toxic to dogs. Um, that can cause problems just like onions, garlic. People may not know that that's... So think about when you're feeding... Um, 
your pet those juices in the bottom of the tray that may have been simmering in onions or garlic right. all day and so there's a lot of very dangerous problems there and, and onions are especially dangerous to cats too mm-hmm. and cats a lot of well. people don't think about cats getting into these things but they will too just mm-hmm. like dogs mm-hmm. yep definitely well so you know we say all these foods that you can't feed what are some okay foods that uh, you can use as treats my favorite for sure is raw carrots little baby mm-hmm. carrot sticks dogs go crazy over those they have a nice little snap to them maybe they think it's a bone but but it's a great thing to use as a low-fat, safe treat. Right, um, to good feed bone you. substitute. Absolutely. Yeah. I also like rice cakes, unflavored, hmm. plain little rice cakes, and the that. small ones. So, you know, they don't have very many calories. They're they're kind of big and crunchy. Mm-hmm. So if I have to give table food, that's going to be what I look for a lot of times. I'll not use that. That's a great idea. Yeah. Rice yeah. cakes, and then um, as well the green beans or just mm-hmm. little sugar snap peas. Also a little snap to them. Low in fat, high in vitamins um, and fiber. So a great substitute for the expensive treats we give or or human food indeed good ideas so any other thoughts for the holidays uh any other ideas for traveling or tips you know i know we reached out to our audience last week and we talked about ideas for for traveling and if you do have ideas to make traveling with your pet easier uh definitely reach out to us and you can reach us at podcast at we love pets.net um, so that's our new address to send us a message here podcast at we love pets.net or pet talk at we love pets.net so either one of those will get those messages right to us so um, we definitely are interested in hearing your your feedback about what does make travel easy and while we're talking about traveling and the holidays and that sort of thing I also want to bring up some information from Partners for Healthy Pets. Uh, This is a group of industry leaders and veterinarians and I'm part of this group actually and uh, what we have been discussing and talking about relates to some statistics that show that nearly 20 percent of dogs and over 30 percent of cats are not traveling in to see their family veterinarian as compared to five years ago and and so I think when we talk about um, traveling with pets we need to think about how to help them travel to the family veterinarian Mm -hmm. and uh, do you have some ideas for making that easier for dogs or cats Dr. McCauley? I do just this last week I saw a case where um, a dog was brought in the owner said the dog is fine it was just for an annual checkup but the dog had serious car anxiety and that almost made the owner say I I don't want to take my dog to the vet because they're so scared and so um, my advice to her at that point was okay we want to make the car uh, um, more of a, a, a non thing, almost a something safe that you, haven. exactly. And so I recommended what I want you to do for the next week, take the dog, go put it, sit it on your lap in the car and just sit there in the garage or the driveway for a minute. Don't start the car. Don't do anything. Just have her sit there and get her used to staying in there with you. Have some carrots. Have some carrots. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Give a little, a little baby carrot if need be and get her associated with that. Then the next week, go out, sit in it, turn the car on. But don't go anywhere. Just turn it on. She's used to the engine going, the radio going, um, and she gets used to that. It's kind of a thing that she says, oh, well, that's that's what's happening today. And then the next week, drive around the block. You know, put her up there, drive around the block, and then... you know, slowly extend that to where it's not a huge deal when she right, gets in the car. Right, just desensitize. Yeah, exactly. and you mentioned the car ride. A, a lot of people really don't go to see the family veterinarian because they're worried about stressing their pets out. And my grandmother, bless her heart, she had a German Shepherd uh, that literally took the bench seat off the <laughs> the the runners and and totally took it off because the dog tried to go Get underneath under. it. <laughs> under, I, I didn't even know you could do that. Yeah, so stronger that is, than steel. That is dedication, uh, right? There. Yeah, yeah, but by God she got that dog to the vet so that's a good thing good. but hopefully it doesn't have to be that difficult it does not have to be and, that's for and sure i think your tips are are wonderful mm-hmm. especially for dogs and it can work for cats too mm-hmm. and if you have a smaller pet like a dog or a cat that's of a tiny size that might ride in a carrier versus loose in the car i think getting the dogs and cats used to a carrier and I know we've talked about feel away before there are some great little handy wipes uh, that feel away makes uh, that have a little synthetic pheromone a uh, little uh, product that mimics the the wonderful uh, pheromone or like a hormone that the mother cat or dog releases when they're nursing and so it really makes that carrier a, a great comfortable place to be by use of this pheromone also feeding the pet in the the carrier and 
giving treats in the carrier, giving more carrots and rice cakes mm-hmm. in the yeah. carrier, those healthy treats. Mm-hmm. Um, so those things really work well to, to it's get. It's all about planning, you know, planning. starting it, it takes before. work. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And that's the thing. It can't be that the only time they go on the cars are one year veterinary visit or when they go on a trip for five hours and they're stressed out. It's better to put them in the carrier and just let them sit there for right. two minutes out. Right. The- how, how often has it been that you've heard that the carrier only comes in the house when it's time to go to the vet and then the dog or the cat runs under the bed and hides and disappears when it's critical time. To at come least in. three times a week. Yeah, at least. probably yep. at least mm-hmm. three times a week. Mm-hmm. So definitely having those carriers out and around where there is a positive association or brought in at least more often than than once a year mm-hmm. when it's time to go to the pet's doctor. Yep. So yeah, good sure. advice. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Well, what else is on your mind besides the holidays and? Yeah feeding tips and going to the veterinarian. Yep. Well, it kind of feeds into uh, something we talked about, and that is um, a tough discussion that we actually see a big increase in after the holidays, and that is quality of life discussions. You know, nobody wants to think about um, having to go to the vet to have the tough talk about, is it time for my dog or my cat to, uh, for me to be considering um, quality of life issues? Right. But we do that see a big so uptick true. in that. Yeah. I don't know why it is in the fall or in the winter months. And, you know, I don't know, maybe it's a, a time where sometimes we see family members that we haven't seen a while and you appreciate changes with them. Uh, but I think people really do start thinking about quality of life for their pets. And I think it's, they want to get one more holiday season for that pet. Right. They don't Can we to. just make it till Christmas Absolutely. or or New yep. Year's. And and so I, I agree with you. I think we see a lot more discussions about quality of life. And I actually came across something uh, recently that uh, I felt like was pretty helpful. And this can be found by Googling veterinaryproductnews.com. And there was actually a quality of life scale that Alice Villalobos posted uh, there through that site. And uh, I liked it. And it is sometimes referred to as the hmm scale Mm -hmm. and that's uh five h is followed by two m's and those uh that acronym stands for hurt hunger hydration hygiene happiness mobility and then more good days than bad and so those are, are a few benchmark evaluation criteria that you can rate on a scale of zero to ten and uh, this particular doctor said that if you have a, uh, a score of greater than 35 that you're probably um, working with a pet that does have some sufficient quality of life to where you can work with them through supportive care to to help them live a longer more comfortable life and so I, I know I for one uh, when I look at quality of life for a pet I want to make sure that they're not hurting I want to make sure that pain is controlled and that they're comfortable and even if mobility may not be the best as long as they're comfortable and able to get around and as long as you can see some uh, positive emotional feedback um, between the the pet and the pet parent uh, I think that's a big deal and do they want to eat do they want those treats are they responsive and excited to see you to see their food uh, do they want to go for walks do they have that get up and go uh, mm-hmm. certainly they may be slower than they once were um, but that's okay as long as all those other factors are there and in place. But yeah, you have to think that it's a very um, subjective decision when you make to you know talk about quality of life and possibly uh, euthanizing a pet. And so to have some objectivity here where you can say, here's a guideline to at least get you um, in the right mindset for how do I assess is my dog or cat right. having more good days than bad days? Are they right. eating and drinking? Um, you know, you can say, well, you know, as long as my dog eats and drinks and peas and poops he's fine well in reality that's not um you know that may not be true that's probably yeah there there really probably should be more and and i think uh, your pet's doctor can really work with you to try to help improve quality of life you mentioned eating and drinking and and certainly those are important parameters but with some of these patients we see like those patients that have borderline kidney function sometimes doing fluid therapy at home and some home uh, therapies to help make that pet more comfortable Uh, those things can really extend life expectancy and even diet I know we've talked Mm -hmm. a lot about diet today sometimes the prescription foods that are available for kidney patients can even double life expectancy so I would encourage anybody who's not partnered with their pet's doctor to have these discussions 
things. And even if you have doubts, go in and set up a quality of life appointment and discuss through what the options are. Um, because sometimes even very simple modifications in care and treatment can really make a big difference. And having somebody, as you say, uh, that's objective or a scale that's objective, those things can really be helpful. And even as a veterinarian, when I've dealt with a, an aging, ailing pet, uh, I found that, you know, here with my vast training that I became so unobjective when it was my own dog. And uh, fortunately, my husband's a veterinarian too, but uh, we had multiple discussions together and, uh, you know, about quality of life and, and just bringing somebody in to, to share that with. Um, it's an and, extremely emotional decision, which you don't want to take all the emotion out of it because that's not what it's about. But it is good to have a scale like this. It's just another tool in our, in our tool book, in our toolbox to, uh, to kind of offer. And I'm glad you said the thing about the, uh, the diet change because um, a lot of the diets that I recommend for kidney patients or um, you know other diseases that we try to treat people will raise a point like wow that's way more expensive than the old Roy I buy at the, uh, <laughs> at the at Walmart but I always say don't think of it as expensive food think of it as cheap medicine because uh, I, would, I would much rather like to treat a problem like that with food than adding in all these different you know, I, I agree so much. Mm-hmm. I always say food really should be your first medicine. Mm-hmm. And and sometimes, you know, it's not a cookie cutter approach that you can take. And mm-hmm. depending on what laboratory testing shows you with a pet, that will guide you as to what a pet needs nutritionally. So again, another reason to partner with your veterinarian. And uh, it's been said that people aren't going to the family veterinarian as often as they once were because of Dr. Google uh, going online and, and nothing replaces that in-person visit and veterinarians really do help uh, pet parents find uh, conditions that need to be detected and they're just the best resource you could hope for uh, to help you with those quality of life uh, questions that come up. I so. always uh, try to make a, a point about using Google which is a great way to find information but think about if you had a problem with your car and you go into Google and say my car is making a sound <laughs> and you put that into Google and it pops up something are you going to really believe that because right. that's very uh, again it's very subjective there's not sure. anything any um, you know real training behind it it's just giving you all the possibilities of what it could be and so if you go into Google and say my my cat is peeing a lot well you know oh it must be a bladder tumor well it might not be it might be that your cat you know has right yeah i've seen it go both ways where people assume it's something worse than what it is Mm -hmm. or something less than what it is but i never mind if people do research no i want them to do research yeah people come in with reams of printouts and and that's great so knowledge is power you want to address all the issues and all the worries that our clients have and to do that it's great if they do have an idea what's going on just remember that um it's not the same as an actual visit. It's not the same as an actual visit. Yes. Absolutely. Correct. Correct. Okay. Well, very good. Well, we're going to take a break now. I see a motion from Roderick up there. And so we'll take Mm -hmm. a moment here just to pause Mm -hmm. and uh, have a public service announcement for you. But we'll come... Yeah, don't forget to uh, subscribe to our link. Um, yes, by thank you. This. Yeah, subscribe to the podcast by uh, clicking right there. Our, our virtual link here. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for the reminder on that. And we'll be back in, with more in just a moment. If you're interested in learning more about any of the products you've seen on our show, click on these links. We thank you for tuning in to Pet Talk Podcast. Now back to the show. Hello, I'm veterinarian Dr. Karen Fling, and we are back for Pet Talk Podcast, and uh, I'm here with my sidekick. That's right, Dr. Will McCauley, and we're coming to you with some more fun animal news. Um, Great fun story that I really like. Um, A kitten that was discovered... um, found outside of Denver last week, um, spent several hours in temperatures at below 10 degrees. This uh, cat was, this kitten was picked up by a good Samaritan and taken to a humane society and they have named her Elsa. Um, I'm sure plenty of you, and you know, even those like me without kids know exactly who well, Elsa is. The star I know my four year old will Frozen. appreciate yeah, that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, she's actually doing very well. Um, they say she has a fighting little spirit and so they think she's going to um, be just fine. So remember that if you do have uh, cats out, that go outside or if your dog is uh, an outside dog, remember that when it gets cold like it is right now, and I think it snowed a little bit in Dallas, it did. they need a protected place um, and a warm place to get in at this they, time of year. They definitely do. And even if they're in the house, if our house temperatures are cooler, I think we really especially need to be looking after our more mature elderly pets. Um, a, a huge percentage of 
adult cats over 10 years of age, probably as much as 90% of these cats have arthritis. Mm -hmm. And cats cover that up to where you don't see it. Dogs frequently have arthritis. Huge percentage of dogs have arthritis. And so making sure that they're warm and comfortable and have cozy bedding, even in the house, it can be cooler at ground level. So keeping in mind comfort and warmth for our pets is so important. Yeah, that's going to be a big discussion on our podcast next week is about arthritis and how um, people all the time say, well, I've noticed it's flring up a lot more in, in my dog since it got cold and yes it does and so we're gonna have to we're definitely talk about does that so they're lot. slower to get up slower to rise there'll be some subtle symptoms you can see mm-hmm. uh, sometimes with dogs in particular as they're getting osteoarthritis of the hips they'll run and lope and they'll do a bunny hop in the back and so sometimes people just think that's a funny frisky gait but it can actually be a sign that your they're dog is experiencing pain mm-hmm. so we'll definitely talk some more about that next week yep, yep. And, and then uh, one of the uh, uh, I guess world's most famous koalas now um, lives down in Australia, as most koalas do. Um, there was a summit of the world's 20 largest economies in Brisbane, Australia, and President Obama, as well as um, Prime Minister of Australia Tony Abbott, Russia's Vladimir Putin, South Korea's Park Geun Hye, and uh, Stephen Harper from Canada all got to hold and love on a koala. Uh, How about that? It was re- mistakenly referred to as koala bear. Koalas actually are not bears, um, oh. they are marsupials. And so they are separate from the bear family, more closely related to kangaroos and possums than bears. Important point. <laughs> and, and maybe next week we'll have a koala here. Ooh, don't tease. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I don't, I don't think we'll have a koala here. Yeah, he'll, he'll be a stuffed one. Yeah. But I'll, I'll tell you what I am hoping that we will have is something pretty neat uh, that is called Pet chats. And this is a neat product that has been developed that uh, works between an app on your phone and kind of like a little Skype setup with a little pod module that hangs on your wall at home to where literally these people say you can greet and treat your pet anytime. So by using your phone, you can connect in through this app, talk to your pet at home, and then signal for a little treat to be released from this this device. I just, think that is so cool. That is very cool. Just don't overuse it. Just when we're talking about not That's getting right. too many trees, be sure that, uh, you know, it's not every time you check in via Skype, they don't need a tree, but that is a really cool product. Yeah, yeah. so we're, we're hoping that we're going to talk with these people some more, and I'd personally like to demo their product, try mm-hmm. it out. Put it um, in the clinic. Exactly. Yeah, and we have a wonderful webcam setup mm-hmm. uh, where pets can be seen remotely by their families, and, uh, you know, of course, most of the time they're lounging and napping and getting up and stretching and you know we're always Still so excited yeah. when they get up and move around or drink water or eat mm-hmm. that kind of thing but mm-hmm. uh, we may have to try this new product pet chats and then actually watch it happening live so mm-hmm. sounds pretty fun to me yeah good well a lot to look forward to next week um, so I think that'll be it for us today again we uh, remind you to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't done that already um, send us your questions to podcast at we love pets.net or pet talk at we love pets.net Absolutely. we want to get uh, some of those questions on the air and answered um, and just uh, we appreciate you tuning in again absolutely we'll be back next week at same time same place with more of pet talk podcast thanks so much for joining us thank you